Welcome to the Capital Forum's sixth annual Antitrust Thought Leaders Interview Series. I'm Sally Hubbard, and I'm here with Gabrielle Kohlmeyer, an attorney at Verizon. Gabrielle, thanks for being here. Thank you, Sally. Um, one thing that we've been hearing so much is that antitrust needs to change, that we're in a monopoly moment and that changes need to happen. What are your view, what's your general view on, on this sentiment? Um, well, I think it is a really interesting and exciting time to be an antitrust lawyer. I think for the first time um, since I started practicing, it's in the headlines all the time. With, and I get questions not just from my antitrust friends, but from family members and so forth. Um, I think that it's an opportunity. Um, I think the debate is very interesting because you've got very polarized different sides and you've got different levels of um, understanding of how antitrust laws work and so a lot of the media coverage um, by non-antitrust experts um, can be um, somewhat shallow in the understanding but very hyped up in terms of what is happening and you know whether we're talking about concentration studies and that there are um, massive increases in concentration that are leading to all kinds of social ills from um, income inequality to undermining our democracy with the elections and so forth. Um, and then seeing the debate on the other side um, within the antitrust community, within the ABA and so forth, um, it's a very different tenor and it's more focused on, well, what is the data actually saying and what, um, what can we draw in terms of inferences from that data? Um, and there, I think there is a robust debate going on. Um, the part that concerns me is when there is some dismissiveness, when um, you know, there are some that dismiss, um, dismiss criticisms of antitrust that are going on right now as just being hipster antitrust or something like that. Because I think one of the things that I find particularly appealing about antitrust is its dynamic aspect and that it was um, written in a way and was intended to um, be practiced in a way that allowed for change and allowed for um, new economic learning, new factual learning. And to me, this is an opportunity to examine, well, are there gaps in antitrust law? Where, where are those gaps? And what can we do in terms of you know, looking at whether there are new antitrust um, economic tools, whether there are legal gaps that you know, could be filled? Um, and so I think it's you know, an interesting and exciting time to explore that and to use this moment um, to assess. And maybe we'll come to a place where we find, no, actually, we really do have very robust tools that can be used um, in a way that is effective. And maybe we're even finding that they are effective. And these um, issues aren't really antitrust concerns and there are other, way, other mechanisms that should be used to address them. Um, but maybe there are gaps that could be filled with you know, potentially novel new theories, novel new tools, and so forth. Yeah, it's funny this whole label of hipster antitrust, right? It's kind of an a, attempt to uh, kind of stigmatize wanting to have change. Um, I guess in the world of DC, hipster is an insult. In my world in New York City, that's actually a compliment. But, um, you know, it's almost an attempt to dismiss, as you said, any any viewpoints that say we do need to have changes because we've, what we've been doing has led us to this monopoly moment that we're in now. Um, in terms of what we could do to fill the gaps, um, I know um, you, you have some ideas of, of kind of different economics approaches we could be using to fill the gaps. Can you talk a little bit about how maybe behavioral economics could be used to fill the, some of the enforcement gaps? Yeah, so I think behavioral economics is a really interesting area um, that should at least be explored. Um, so I, I think that it is relatively new to the field of antitrust. Um, we started talking about it, I think, about 10 years ago, but there hasn't been a particularly robust um, economic study of it. Um, and it seems like an area that could um, supplement a lot of the frameworks that we currently have um, and do, you know, potentially, depending on what those um, economic findings are, um, it, it's one tool that might actually fill some of the holes that um, people perceive as being, you know, creating this deficit in antitrust, in antitrust enforcement. So to take a step back, 
Could you just explain on a general level for those who don't know, what is behavioral economics? Yeah, so um, behavioral economics is basically, so classical economics focuses very much on the idea um, and one of the big frameworks of um, neoclassical economic models is that it's based on the rational man that is um, completely rational, has perfect willpower, and narrowly pursues his self-interest. And um, the behavioral economics borrows from areas such as neurology, psych uh, psychology, sociology, um, to look at ways in which um, that view of a re perfectly rational actor might not be how things actually play out in reality. Um, and there are a number of different ways that um, behavioral ec economists have found um, undermine this assumption that we can rely on a perfectly rational actor. So one, for example, is the idea that um, you always act in your self-interest. We see examples all the time where people don't necessarily act in their self-interest. So um, there's this idea uh, of beha in behavioral economics of unbounded rationality, which means that you are actually acting in a way that's contrary to your long-term self-interest, such as doing things like smoking, such as doing things like um, uh, you know, spending more money than you have and so forth. Um, and so people will use things like commitment mechanisms and things like that to try to counterbalance that, which then leads them to, for example, overpay. So for example, when you pay more in taxes because you want to have a large tax refund in the end, if you are a perfectly rational actor acting to maximize your, um, well, your wealth, um, you would spend, you know, do the exact amount of taxes and get the interest and not forego that and give that as a gift to the government. But because we know our limitations, um, that is, for example, that, that would be an example of unbounded willpower, that we don't have um, willpower to keep ourselves from um, overspending, for example. Um, unbounded rationality is the idea that we don't always um, act in our rational self-interest. And then there's um, unbounded um, Sorry, I just totally forgot. Hopefully we can cut Bounded that. Bounded self-interest? Unbounded self-interest, exactly. And so unbounded self-interest is um, the idea that there are some things that matter more to us than just pursuing our narrow self-interest, that things like justice and fairness might matter more to us. And whether it's um, justice to ourselves or justice for other people or fairness. Um, so one example is that you know, if you get $10,000, it might mean less to you if you know that I'm getting $20,000. Um, and so that doesn't seem fair. And so you might, you know, object to that, even though overall you are actually being benefited by this. So a perfectly rational actor would be very happy with that. And so um, how does, do these concepts apply in the antitrust context? So um, behavioral economics, um, as I said, started um, creeping into um, antitrust thinking about 10 years ago um, through a number of different, um, uh, through the literature, academics studying it, um, and a number of economists proposing this as something that we really should be looking at as a potential tool, um, but it hasn't quite filtered into a lot of actual antitrust um, case law um, and antitrust approaches that I'm aware of yet um, because there is this idea that we need more economic study around it. Uh, but it offers a way to fill some uh, potential gaps in areas that particularly um, are very fact specific. Um, so potentially not in the court setting where you know, you're creating these precedents that apply across you know, lots of different types of situations. But in the merger context, for example, where you have very fact-intensive, fact-specific decision-making, um, behavioral economics um, can provide a tool where you can uh, use these, these concepts that look for incentives that diverge from what a rational decision maker would be doing um, and how behavior can be explained that would not potentially otherwise be explained. Um, and so 
the merger context, for example, is an area that would be particularly um, an area that is ripe for behavioral economic input in certain situations. Another one would be um, if you've got sectoral specific um, areas where you are looking, there are aberrations from what you would expect under neoclassical economics. That might be another area where um, you could explain some of these divergences through behavioral economics. Um, and, and in general, areas where you are looking for something is different than you would expect under the traditional economic models um, because for some reason people aren't acting the way that you would expect them to act. Firms aren't acting the way that you expect them to act. Then those are all areas where behavioral economics can kind of provide some input. And to me the reason why I find it particularly interesting and intriguing is because um, you know, we spend so much, um, and enforcers spend so much time asking for documents and looking at that kind of evidence. And I think that it makes a lot of sense when you're looking at, well, what are the companies that you're studying, especially in this antitrust moment where we're looking at particular kinds of um, companies that are dominant, for example. A lot of them have been employing behavioral economists for the past 10 years to understand consumers to understand consumer behavior so that they can exploit when consumers are acting irrationally. And so if we want to understand what the firms are thinking, um, then I think it makes sense to understand that framework. Um, so it can, help, uh, it can help explain how consumers might be acting in a way that is not necessarily um, what we view it, would view as rational. It can explain why firms are acting in a certain way that you wouldn't necessarily expect. Um, and it can, from, so from an in-house perspective, it could also, and from a counseling perspective generally, it can even explain some of the ways that agencies might be approaching something in a way that wouldn't necessarily be what you would expect because there are these different influences that are changing their incentives um, to go after you know, companies that you wouldn't really expect under traditional framework um, they would go after. Um, so I, I think that there are a lot of different ways in which behavioral economics can kind of do that. And um, you know, going back to my in-house role, one of the areas that I find uh, particularly interesting um, that behavioral economics can play a role in is in compliance um, because it can explain the ways in which, um, so if you look at the behavioral economic literature, there's a lot of discussion about what actually resonates with people, what will actually convince them to change behavior. And you can present someone with a very shocking statistic um, and they will be shocked and they'll tell their friends about it and then they'll forget about it. Um, and if you, so if I tell you, you know, um, if you, they, there have been, um, you know, 500 enforcement actions and there have been 25 executives that have gone to prison in the last year and have you know, been sentenced to sentences of five to 10 years, um, that might horrify some executives or some you know, employees, but just the statistics aren't necessarily gonna resonate. The stories, however, will. And so it helps you communicate in a way that can enhance your compliance efforts, for example. Um, same thing with when you communicate not just the frequency of how often something happens, um, but the, um, the, the risk of it happening, um, that can affect how people make decisions and whether or not they're willing to engage in risky behavior. And that obviously can also filter into you know, how we present our compliance programs to make them most effective. On the point that you were making about certain industries and certain companies that have been employing behavior economics um, themselves um, and how it could be used to explain behavior that antitrust is not really understanding under its traditional frameworks, would big tech be one of those categories? Well, we know that um, you know, um, Google and Facebook and so forth um, certainly have been employing a lot of um, behavioral e economists. I think Uber um, has talked very publicly um, and um, had really interesting um, explanation. They, their economist has um, talked, I think, on various different outlets about exactly the kinds of behaviors that they look at to maximize um, their app, to maximize you know, how people will um, 
people are more willing to spend more in certain situations, they will absolutely, so one interesting um, example, for example, is that uh, people are very willing to pay, you know, $20 for a ride, but, tw or $21 for a ride, but $20 they're not willing to pay because that seems arbitrary. And so it's these things where even though, you know, the, the number is higher, it sounds more reasonable to you, so you're more willing to accept that. And these are all things that Uber, for example, um, just you know, as one of many, many companies, um, is using behavioral economics to price. Um, and it's not just the big tech companies. I mean, there are a lot of retailers that have been using this. A lot of marketing consultants um, use a lot of behavioral economics. But it's very much focused on um, how do we understand our consumers and how can we use that to best market our products. And I imagine in the age of big data, they can actually drill down using algorithms um, and f identify those behaviors much more easily than in the past. Yeah. They probably know things about our behaviors that we don't <laughs> even know, right? <laughs> I feel like that's kind of been the news this week, right? Um, I'm not an, engin an algorithm engineer or software. Um, person, so I don't have any personal insight into that, but it seems plausible. Um, so, you also mentioned that companies could behave in ways you don't expect, and that's something that I've been paying a lot of attention to, especially the millennial generation wants to have a social impact side to what they're doing professionally. How does behavioral economics apply to companies acting in a way that wouldn't be considered really rational under traditional economics? Yeah, and I think that this is um, one of the areas that you know has sprung to mind to me a lot lately. Is because um, so Verizon, for example, and I know um, a number of other companies are really focusing on corporate social responsibility um, as a an important focus and and. Um, being part of the community and having these outreach efforts, um, taking stands on things like, you know, in at this m moment it's things like immigration, the Me Too movement, all of these things, which are not profit generating endeavors, um, but they're really important um, to the company. And I think, you know, a lot of it has to do with being driven by employees, being driven by, you know, board members that who care about these issues um, and that you know we are sort of in a moment where social responsibility um, I think has taken heightened importance um, compared to times in the past and that just diverges from this idea that a firm is only going to be operating in a perfectly rational you know profit maximizing manner um, so that would be one of the examples of how firms are operating differently. And I think, you know, you mentioned the millennial generation. I think that there um, have been a number of studies that show that there are a lot of millennials that are actively choosing companies to work for companies, to start companies, um, to support companies that are not, that they perceive at least, are not purely driven by profit motive and motives, but by actually, you know, doing these kind of um, corporate social justice initiatives. So, are, are there particular are there particular areas that you see as the most well suited for behavioral economics, in terms of uh, procedural or different types of um, of you know legal processes or legal um, frameworks that would be most suited for for in, incorporating BE. Um, so I think that um, it's kind of the areas that I mentioned before. Merger seems like a very easy um, area because it is focused on incentives and facts, and it's very fact-driven, um, and it's um, looking at, well, how did the facts in this case potentially change from what you would expect in, you know, under neoclassical economics. Um, and I think a situation like that is precisely kind of area where, um, where behavioral economics could be an added tool. Um, now I think that, you know, it's again, it's just one of the tools and I think that's the whole point of um, a lot of um, what's going on right now that we have an opportunity to explore, well, 
how can we supplement um, or you know, do we need to supplement antitrust and do we need new legal tools and economic tools that can help us um, get to some of the concerns that are being raised um, within the uh, antitrust community and without. But I think the point is you know, let's focus on um, where there might be deficiencies and what we can bring um, to fix that and behavioral economics seems like an area. And in your view, that. this would be to supplement existing uh, economic pro uh, theory, not to supplant it. Is that correct? I think that that's right, yeah. And you know, going back, um, you had asked earlier about um, hipster antitrust. I think one of um, the things to note about behavioral economics is that this is not a strand of hipster um, antitrust or that it would, you know, supplement that. Um, that idea, because I mean, the underlying point of hipster antitrust is that um, the consumer welfare standard is insufficient, and we we need to, um, you know, you've got lots of different viewpoints, but you could go anywhere from um, we need to completely redo the system, um, or and you know have an entirely different focus of antitrust, um, you know, whether it's a total welfare standard, a public interest standard, or what have you. Um, to, well, we at least need to broaden the consumer welfare standard. And I think one of the things um, that's nice about behavioral economics is that it really doesn't have a goal in mind. It's really not that, okay, well, if you want to upend the consumer welfare standard, behavioral economics is a tool that will help you get to that certain end. Um, but that it, it just focuses on the, this idea that there are times when the, this assumption that is part of all of traditional antitrust, whether you're talking about Chicago school, Harvard school, school, post-Chicago school, all of them have this assumption of a rational actor, a rational firm, um, and that there might be times when that assumption doesn't hold. And this is a way to get to where that assumption not holding might lead to failures in antitrust um, enforcement, antitrust um, generally. So, How did you become interested in behavioral economics? Um, well, I have um, somewhat of an economic background, but I think that it largely comes from um, it comes from my focus. Uh, I focus a lot on um, women and diversity issues, and a lot of these concepts arise um, in terms of decision making and how you know we've got a lot of things that are undermining women and diversity initiatives such as unconscious bias. Well, that's kind of a strand of people not necessarily acting as they even themselves think that they are acting. Um, and you know, it kind of goes into this idea of rationality and how um, we have all of these behaviors that we might not even be cognizant of. And behavioral um, economics and um, these behavioral psychology studies, um, I, I see a lot of overlap between um, strands of rationality in that context that then, you know, led me to think about it more and more in the antitrust context as well. Um, and I just think that it's a really interesting, um, it's interesting to think about how we have such a f solid foundation where rationality is such an assumption in everything that we do in our current antitrust frameworks and current antitrust enforcement that this um, presents an opportunity to think outside of the box a little bit. And I think we need to do the same thing in terms of women and diversity initiatives to actually move those forward as well. So it's kind of all bled together in that sense. That's a great point because diversity has been shown in so many studies to lead to better business results, but still we don't see it at the top at most companies, right? So the idea that there's, that rationality is supreme is quite misguided. Yeah. Um, well, Gabrielle, this has been such an interesting conversation. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, Sally, for having me. This is fun.